What does it take to keep you? This morning we're going to rehearse from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 65 through 71. Feel free to look up on the big screen if you like. But as I mentioned earlier, the rich young man was just one who walked away from Jesus. The Father of Scripture, several at one time, who had been disciples, leaving at once due to not being able to understand the difficult teaching. The difficult teaching was when Jesus said, You shall drink my blood and eat my flesh. Yes, that sounded so outlandish. That sounded out of this world. It sounded horrendous. And Jesus was referring to the fact that he was about to be crucified. That he's about to lay his life down willingly and spill and shed his blood for them. And that it would be commemorated, the sacrifice would be commemorated in what was the Jews' Passover that would be his last supper that we now commemorate as Holy Communion, which we're about to do today. But they walked away and would get discouraged simply because they didn't understand that one part. Many people today want to argue and debate doctrine. They want to walk away from church families over doctrine. They want to walk away from the place where God's called them to be. They want to walk away from the church homes all through the doctrine. Amen. People were doing it back then just because they couldn't understand. Hallelujah. But I'm here to tell you, we serve a God that wants us to understand. We serve a God that will speak to us. This church has been going over one of the hardest books in all the Bible to understand, Revelation. And in chapter 17 and 18, I've been been speaking with the folks to come on Wednesday nights so of how many people give up on that book. We're crying out to God, aren't we, folks? We're crying out to God saying, reveal this to us. Amen? And there's some things we're getting from commentary, and there's some things that are only born into us by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. But in this time, Jesus makes one mention of something they don't understand, and they walk away. It says in verse 65 of the Gospel of John, chapter 6, and it says, Jesus said, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him by my Father. From that time, many, somebody say many, many, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? He had made mention of something they didn't understand. And they all began to depart from him. I would imagine, we know that he sent out 70 at one time before this. These were folks that had been sent out in his name. They had seen great signs and wonders. They had ministered in his name. They had been disciples of his. But now they walk away. Now we don't know what happens to them later. For the day of Pentecost, when it took place in the upper room, 120 people gathered. I would imagine it wasn't just because of things that Peter and the rest of them had done. There was some remnant of these disciples and perhaps they came back. We don't know for sure each individual specifically. But we do know that at one time a multitude of people walked away from Jesus. And this has comforted me in the times Pastor Jerry when people have walked away from me. Because I'm able to look at this Bible and see that they walked away from the Lord. That's right. And if they walk away from Him what makes you think they won't walk away from you? Hallelujah. And so they walk away from him at one time. And in his flesh, Sister Linda, I would imagine, his heart was breaking. The time that he had sown into them, discipling them, loving on them, teaching them, walking and talking with them, living amongst them. And they walk away. And then he asks this profound, compassionate, heartfelt question. He looks at the twelve. Those that have been with him, perhaps the crowd, perhaps the congregation, perhaps somewhat committed, but now he's looking at the core. And he's looking at them and he's saying, do you also want to go away? Do you want to leave me too? Do you want to walk away like they did? And then Peter, bless his heart, he speaks up. Like only Peter can. We identify with Peter, don't we? Because we've been like him. We've wavered. We've been up and down. We've walked on water at times and then we've looked to the left and the right and we started drowning in our lack of faith. That way. We've pushed back. We've turned. We've denied. We've been so mad that we can kick and cuss, haven't we? Come on, Christians. 
But at some point, you got to get grounded. You got to speak faith. You got to get solid and have some solidarity. When Jesus says, Do you also want to go away? Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? That's right. To whom shall we go? Reminds me of the old hymn that says, Where can I go? But to the Lord. Where can I go? But to the Lord. He says, To the Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words. Somebody say words. Of eternal life. You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know. Now, that's huge right there. It took faith to believe. It, and then your faith, as your faith increases in what you believe, it becomes a fact that you know. That nobody can come along with something new and try to talk you out of what you know. I, mean, I know Jesus is Lord. I know He's the Son of God. I know He died on that cross. I know He came back from the grave. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know He's coming back for me. I know He lives inside of me. You can't come up with something new to try to persuade me to get away from those facts. Those solid facts that I know. Peter says, we've also come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Yes. Jesus answered him and said, did I not choose you, the twelve, the core? Verse 71, he said, he spoke of, when he was talking about one of them being the devil, he spoke of Judas Iscariot, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. But we're talking about what does it take to keep him. Now, when it comes to that rich young man that I mentioned earlier in the opening of this message, we never hear anything else further about him, do we? We never find out what happens to him. If he became a part of the, the movement, the early church, or whether he did or didn't. Nor do we uh, specifically know about those who walked away from Jesus at the beginning of our text, that multitude of people from John chapter 6. We don't know specifically what happened to those folks that walked away. But we do know exactly what happened to two of the twelve disciples mentioned in the latter part of the text. We know what happened to Peter, don't we? Yeah. We know that Peter would later deny him. He would deny him. He would go from getting fight mad and wanting to cut somebody in the midst of the arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane to later on denying Jesus. Just like Jesus said he would. He denied. No, I don't know the man. Weren't you one of the ones who were with him? No, I don't know the man. Oh, I, I, I recognize you. You were one of the ones who were with the Galilean that they're trying in there over Caiaphas' house. And then he goes to say some choice words. And he denies Jesus. And he hears the rooster crow. I believe conviction began to fall on Peter. But he would deny him. He would deny him. Then Judas would betray him. Judas would betray him and Jesus would even mention the fact that he would betray him. And he goes and sells the Lord out. And when he does, perhaps he didn't know that Jesus would really be arrested and he would really let him take him. Whether he did or whether he didn't, we know that he would try to give the money back. But it was too late. Judas had gone too far. Peter would be restored. When Jesus came back, he asked him three times, do you love me? That first time, went over that first time, he covered that first time, then he denied him. That second time, he asked, do you love me? He covered the second time, then he denied him. That third time, he asked, do you love me? And he covered that third time, because the Bible says love covers a multitude of sin. So for every denial, love had to be proclaimed. And he proclaimed his love for Jesus and he was restored and became a champion of the gospel, a leader of, of the first Christian church. While Judas would self-destruct. He'd walk away and go too far that he couldn't come back. Conviction and guilt would overwhelm him and would he would destroy himself. In the Garden of Gethsemane, upon Judas' betrayal leading to Jesus' arrest, even the core disciples would scatter and even abandon him as he faced a mock trial in his cross alone. They all would abandon him all at one time in the Garden of Gethsemane. Yet at even the beginning of that week, 
leading up to these events which we commemorate today as Palm Sunday. Multitudes aligned the streets of Jerusalem, waving palm branches and crying out one thing that day. Hosanna in the heights, as we did during praise and worship. But they cried out one thing that day, and something totally opposite days later. Days later, those same people in that crowd, perhaps they were just in the crowd, they weren't committed. They cried out, Hosanna in the highest, but days later they said, Crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. They had been talked into turning away. They had been talked into walking away. What does it take to keep? We should desire to stay where we are loved and celebrated. Amen? People stay where they're loved and celebrated, not where they're put up with and tolerated. They stay where they're loved and where they're celebrated. In a marriage where there's no love and there's no celebration, it's hard to keep it together. In a relationship or friendship where there's no camaraderie and there's no love and there's no celebration of one, one another, it's hard to keep that relationship going. We should desire to stay where we are loved and celebrated and no one church, listen, no one has ever loved and celebrated us like Jesus has. The Bible says, greater love hath no man than he that would lay his life down for his friends. And while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. Nothing says love like outstretched nail scarred hands on a cross. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world and condemn the world, but through Him some might be saved. The world might be saved. God is love, the Bible says. Nobody loves you like Jesus. And we walk away from so much. We get offended. We get discouraged. We get disconnected. We get disinterested. We get uninvolved. And we begin to walk away from so many things. We walk away from family. We walk away from callings. We walk away from friends. We walk away from our churches. And many are still walking away from the Lord. I want to ask you today, what does it take to keep you. What does it take to keep you? He shouldn't have to dazzle you and entertain you anymore. He did all he needed to do over 2,000 years ago on that cross. He said, I love you in the greatest way anybody's ever said I love you. That ought to be enough today. So I would ask you to stand in this time. I would ask for you to stand. Before we partake of one of the most important institutions in the church, right there with baptism, this is a very important thing. God used a gentleman 